five seconds to submerge us, submerge us deep into the absurd. Hello. This is Into the Absurd, an episode I'm going to call on making all things equal. It will kind of serve as an introduction to some of the work, uh, the later episodes that I'm going to be doing, um, some of which will be with Mina, regarding televisual culture, mass media, um, essentially all those things that are in our culture, in our entertainment, uh, in our education that kind of um, get us all on the same thinking space, the same headspace. Um, I don't want to call them mass manip- manipulation because uh, manipulation kind of puts on that tone of it being intentional. Um, intentional. It's sort of, because like uh, what we have in our entertainment on TV, I mean, it's not, sure, everything that you watch on TV, it will make you think of something. But as far as our media being this intentional, subliminal mind control thing, I mean, that's just not, (laughs) that it, it couldn't be further from the truth of that being something that's, it's there. I mean, our, our our media is there because there's wonderful people out there who love creating stories, who love writing stories, um, and they're passionate about that. So they go and they they make TV, they make film, they make movies, they make uh, they write books, right? Um, and this stuff isn't intended to manipulate anyone, but um, it does. It um, art does the other thing. Art makes you think. Art, I mean, all entertainment, it makes you think. Um, whether by making you laugh, making you cry, uh, it, it, it makes you feel emotions, right? Um, and it's not, it's not intentional manipulation. It's, uh, it's just kind of all a part of this uh, cultural zeitgeist that is kind of building up over time. Um, people write things kind of as a progression of the culture that they live within, right? Um, it, it's it's like an internal projection of their own consciousness upon um, the world, right? Um, it's like if we're, if we're writing a mural on the wall, um, each artist contributes to it, right? And that's our culture. Um, everything that they pain is unique, but, um, it still has, it still kind of flows with everything else that's there. Right. Um, but with that being said, uh, these things kind of trap us into a solitary singular way of thinking. Um, we're all thinking alike. Um, and it's not good to, for everyone to think alike. Sure, it creates a peaceful society, a peaceful civilization, but it also leads to um, complacency, leads to a lack of progress. Um, and I'll put progress in quotes <laughs> there. Um, it, it leads to stagnation, that's a better word for it. Um, and stagnation isn't, I mean, what happens to a pool of water that lies stagnant? I mean, it gets diseased, right? It's not good. Um, new thoughts and new ideas are important for culture. They're important for the development of um, personality, right? I mean, they're important for happiness, for joy. Um, And with that said, um, in order to escape being like a singular-minded society or a society where everyone kind of thinks alike or at least um, there's huge groups of people who only think one thing, you know, and they can't um, think of anything else. Like, uh, for an example, with modern culture, we have Republicans and Democrats, right? Uh, Democrats all think alike, Republicans all think alike, and they can't really agree on anything, right? Um, 
And that's not good, right? And we want to escape that mode of thought. And to do that, we kind of need to bring our attention from the outside world into the inside world, right? And that requires knowing about yourself. Um, in Islam, I think it's, uh, they say that to know thyself is to know God. And I take that, and, and I'm an atheist, I don't believe in God, but, but when I hear that, I think to know yourself is to know the universe, right? Um, to go, to dive deep within your own internal framework, you'll be able to better understand the world around you. And I mean, we do kind of, at least what, what, what psychologists uh, use, tend to say is that a lot of what we experience about the world, a lot of what we conceptualize about it is just projections of our own self-knowledge, okay? But if we don't know anything about ourselves and we only know things through the lens of what our society tells us, how we should know things, then how can we really even say that we even know anything about the world, right? So with that being said, self-knowledge is kind of the first fundamental step to breaking out of kind of a herd frame of mind of thinking like everyone else. And with that said, that um, that's like the first step of breaking out of being like everyone else, of being equal to everyone else. And that's kind of a good segue to go into this. It's going to be, I, I'm not 100% sure how it's going to be. It's either going to be kind of a audio essay um, where I kind of just read it. Or it'll be sort of like I'll break away from reading the essay, um, an essay that I wrote, and kind of like talk more like a human being instead of a robot reading an essay, right? Um so we'll see how it goes, but it's called On Making All Things Equal. Okay. So the, the familiar notion that all men are created equal, that all human beings have it in them to be what they desire, that all humans are, in essence, the same. When we take this notion and turn it into something that's literal, that all men are equal, that all people are equal. This is a lie. It's not true. It's mythology. Or at least uh, this literal interpretation of all men are created equal is a mythology. People are different, right? But indeed, under the new post-enlightenment democratic governments of the 18th century, all men are created equal in the eyes of the law. That is, all men are subject to the same laws and are protected by the same laws. This idea that all men are created equal under the eyes of the law was revolutionary for this time. As it meant a, well, maybe this is debatable, but it meant a greater freedom and definitely a greater security than ever before. Yet this same notion is likewise destructive to the personal sovereignty of the individual when taken to its extreme. One is alienated from their uniqueness as they examine the literal implications of the notion that all men are created equal. One becomes nothing but a drop of water in an ocean. They are swallowed up by the masses. They are made equal with everyone else. Indeed, the, the notion that life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are unalienable rights in a world where all men are created equal is faulty. How exactly does a drop of water in an ocean, a speck of dust in a desert, or a star in a sea of galaxies supposed to feel that they have such rights when they cannot even differentiate themselves from their fellow human beings? 
Do all people view life, liberty, and happiness the same? Are all notions of what makes life, life, what makes freedom, freedom, and happiness, happiness, the same? You see, uh, civilization, when looked at as an attempt to make the chaotic controlled, likewise turns the different into the equal. And although all people in Western civilization are given these unalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, they do not whatsoever interpret these rights the same way. And because of this, um, the, the application of these rights over the whole of a society becomes meaningless to the individual. In a universe filled with infinite chaos, no one singular person who in and of themselves is infinitely different from everyone else, infinitely unique, entirely, entirely just uniquely different from everyone else, is guaranteed life, liberty, or the pursuit of happiness. That said, uh, this is kind of a, a, a breakaway, but, but language, like civilization, is a tool that turns the chaotic into controlled and consolidated. Nietzsche has, uh, he, he's, he's also made the claim that language is a form of, quote-unquote, making all things equal. He writes in On Truth and Lie in an Extra Moral Sense, which is an essay I found in the portable Nietzsche, translated by Walter Kaufman. Um, he writes that, quote, Every concept originates through our equating what is unequal. No leaf ever wholly equals another, and the concept leaf is formed through an arbitrary abstraction from these individual differences, through forgetting the distinctions. And now it gives rise to the idea that in nature there might be something besides the leaves, which would be leaf, some kind of original form after which all leaves have been painted but by unskilled hands, so that no copy turned out to be a correct, reliable, and faithful image of the original form. End quote. Now this is a good thought, right? Uh, that we, we take the word leaf, and we, we use it to describe all leaves, right? Um, we're, we're making all leaves equal by doing so. I'm not saying that this, uh, me or Nietzsche, like neither of us are saying that this is a, that this is the bad thing, right? I mean, we need to do this in order to speak to each other. It's, it's vital and it's, it's awesome that we can do it, right? But I mean, he, uh, what he's saying here is a very good description of what language is. It's, it's, uh, it's forgetting differences and making things equal, right? Um, that is, language, if seen as a symbolic interpretation of our perception, aims to compare and contrast all that exists within our perception or to ascertain definitions and statements which symbolize this perception. Consciousness, if we see it as our experience or perception of reality over time, is, is kind of, it's, it's sort of symbolized by the communicator in every word they speak or write. For example, when someone tells a story, they're symbolizing their imagination or their memories so that the listener may then de-symbolize these words into their imagination, into their cognition. So uh, a language is a form of translation for feelings, perceptions, conceptions, will states, and senses that when translated to others or even to oneself, inflict a sort of pseudo-perception upon the listener, a pseudo-shared perception or conceptualization of what is being perceived and felt by the speaker. Language is like a box full of objects. The box itself is quite bland, but once opened, we are immersed into a whole new world. 
Um, it, in other words, when, when we speak, we're putting our sensations, perceptions, intentions, feelings, etc., into a box. When the other person opens the box, they are presented with these sensations, perceptions, intentions, feelings, etc. Yet they might not understand them. And in fact, they probably won't. They may ask, what is their value? What is their purpose? Uh, what do they mean? Why did you put these things in the box, right? But even after the answer, it still might not be understood. That is, while the word notebook symbolizes the same objects for two people, a notebook, it will likely still bring on different feelings, value judgments, interpretations for these two people. Right? When, uh, like, for instance, if, if, if I see a notebook, I think of writing. I think notebooks are used for writing, right? But, and, and I value notebooks. I, I like them. But, like, if someone who, say, a, a construction worker or someone who just doesn't do any writing or doesn't take any notes or doesn't draw, will look at a notebook and think, that's a notebook, right? They, like, like, like they probably won't really uh, have much of a thought about the notebook. They won't really be thinking about it that much, right? It doesn't really have any use to them. I mean, it, it could be if they, if they do need to write a note every now and then, but the, the value is very low, right? If, if you don't use notebooks that often, you don't really value them that much, right? Um, so me and me, uh, someone who likes to write notebooks and someone else that doesn't like to write notebooks, if I were to give someone that doesn't like to write notebooks a notebook as a gift, um, they'll think, why did you give me this, right? Um, I don't write. Well, why did you give me a notebook? What's the point? Right. But if they gave me a notebook, then I'd appreciate it because I write notebooks, right? This same thing, when we say the word notebook, it just, uh, it, it means different things. It has a different value to different people, right? Um, the, the same sentence, when told to two different nations, could bring both peace or war, depending on the cultural interpretation of this sentence, right? And so, um, two people speaking the same language might still not fully understand each other. That is, again, the problem with taking literally that, quote, all men are created equal. All people living perhaps in a similar manner to everyone else in so far as everyone eats, sleeps, feels, thinks, you know, all the standard things that living things do. They all still live in uniquely different worlds than everyone else. All humans live in separate minds with a whole separate, unique set of experiences, feelings, ideals, friends. And it is, it is language. It is so that language, although being humanity's greatest connection to one another, still does not ever fully connect us. It doesn't always... You, you can't always translate how you feel or how you perceive the world into words that will perfectly translate into another person, right? And this, um, this sucks, right? I mean, I mean, uh, you're you're bound to be understood in in life because you just can't always say the right thing, right? You you can't always say you can't always say things in terms that other people are gonna understand. In this way, a language is kind of like the shadows on the wall of Plato's cave. We only see the silhouette of what was once before the perception of another person. 
we cannot see the colors, edges, depth, or the patterns, or the little intricacies of that which is being described or discussed. Only kind of a, a ghost of this on which we impose our own psychological perceptions upon. Right? Someone tells you a story. Uh, um, I was at the beach, and I brought my dog there, and this guy yelled at me, right? Um, you, you say that to someone, and they're imagining in their head, right? And they're going to project their own idea of, of what someone yelling at you would be like and what the beach looks like. Um, how many kids are there, you know, like, because when I say that, I think of, um, I think of going to, to Honeysuckle Beach up where I'm from as a lifeguard and taking my dog there and some dudes like yelling at me, right? Um, but when I say that to someone else, they'll probably imagine a beach that they're more familiar with, maybe with a dog that they can't imagine them having and a person that they can imagine yelling at them, right? Um, with that said, um, all, all people are different. Um, all, all things are different. But since the human mind, which seeks to understand the whole universe, cannot understand these infinitely many individually unique things, it must instead find patterns and similarities between things, and likewise know when to differentiate them, more so know not when to ignore or forget their differences, right? The, the best way to accomplish this, in such a way that everyone can compare and contrast the world in a similar fashion, is through language, the ultimate equalizer and translator of one's conscious experience. Science and mathematics as forms of language are not open to interpretation precisely because they are refined forms of language. That is, they cater perfectly to how the brain understands the world. For example, 2 plus 2 equals 4 because we can say that one object is in fact one object and when we have two sets of these two single objects we can add them together to have four objects, right? That is, mathematics first and foremost defines and differentiates objects into separate things, then compares and describes them in how they relate to other similar objects which exist on the same scale of things in terms of size or dimension. Um, and when I was pursuing my mathematics degree, I was in this discrete, I'm not sure if it was called discrete mathematics or symbolic logic or I can't quite remember but but in mathematics we have the these things called groups right kind of it's kind of a we can set things as groups of objects right um, or sets right like we have the uh, the rational numbers we have the the irrational numbers um, and all these other sets of numbers, right? And and you can only pick from this set, right? Um, and, and there are certain things that are included in the set, certain things that are excluded. But it, in summary, mathematics, it defines sets of things, right? And it uses these sets of things to make a series of numerical and, qu and quantitative comparisons between things, comparisons and similarities. Um, statements of equality, right? So, uh, so when someone asks why does mathematics work so well to describe the phenomena of the universe, <laughs> I really want to ask them, why does a ruler work so well to measure distance? It is simply the function of mathematics to translate the world into terms that we understand. We understand the world through symbols and language. Mathematics, rulers, scales, etc. are then tools that translate the world into symbols. That is, we use mathematics to equalize and translate our complex perception of reality into easily understood concepts that then work extremely well 
within the framework of how our own minds understand reality, which is through symbols, through relationships, through, uh, through e equalities, through making things different. Language is then almost a, it's kind of a, a measure of consciousness, a, a measure and a description of consciousness. Language is, it's, it's after all, it's, a, it's precisely what we consider to be our consciousness, right? When we refer to our conscious mind, we're, we're thinking of language. Um, the the quote-unquote word sayer is the I, which we associate with being us. I only exists as a subject of language directed at the self, the same self which thinks, perceives, and feels, where then the, the perceiver or the experiencer who associates the I and Greg as the most sacred subjects in the English language. I mean, Greg, that's, uh, when I hear the word Greg, I think that's, that's me. That's me. They're talking to me. They're talking about me. Because and and that that that's something special to me, right? Because that's my whole universe, my whole reality, Gregland, right? I I live in Gregland, but no one else can come to Gregland except for me. I can only tell you about it, and I might not be that good at telling you about it, right? Um, so you might not understand what Gregland is like. And, and you're never going to be able to go there, right? And this is precisely why the, the particulars are so much more difficult to understand than the global. Everyone is so different. Everyone lives in their own land where no one else can go. I cannot describe them all. I can't describe all people, right? I, I can't just uh, make huge blanket statements about how all people act. I can only really say how, how I act or how some people in my life act, right? And even then I might still be faulty, right? No matter how much data I have. Everyone and everything is unique. Similarities and the, the, the big picture are easy to see, but the particulars are so infinitesimally small that every man has a mind which appears to be more complicated than the whole universe. The human being, as a dynamic, changing observer, is constantly thinking, feeling, or doing something different in every moment. And it is thus that they are impossible, even to themselves, to understand entirely or even at all. And this is precisely, in, in my opinion, why things like quantum mechanics has yet to be proved compatible with the theory of relativity. We simply don't have the ability to understand something so... Um, it, it's kind of just so alien to us. It's so... It, it's not that it's... It's not even that it's complex, right? It's just that it's... The concepts of the theory of relativity and quantum mechanics, which... I'll, I'll set back, because we, we understand the particulars of these two, right? We, we understand what the theory of relativity is. We understand what quantum mechanics is and, and how it works. But we don't know how the two interact. We don't know how they're compatible, right? And the, the thing is that the small scale of atoms is so utterly different from our scale of how we see things and like the huge, like gig gargantuous size of planets in the universe, um, that the two concepts are kind of like they're they're almost alien to each other, right? Um, and and we want to connect them, but we're just not. I'm not I'm not a physicist, but we're, we're just not like we we can't really link them to each other because the two concepts are just so alien from each other, right? And besides that, we can see the theory of relativity a lot easier. You know, it, it can be measured easier. Um, 
it's it, it's also just easier to conceptualize. It's easier to understand because it doesn't involve particles basically like like teleporting or being like intertwined um, across space and time, which is just extremely confusing, and I don't understand it at all. But with that said, the, the concepts are entirely different from one another. Additionally, we can more easily see the effects of relativity than we can in quantum mechanics. The, the more easily seen is more easily understood, since we can only understand that which we can perceive. Um, so as that said, uh, mid-20th century philosopher and psychologist Carl Jung, he laid out the fundamental difficulty of understanding particulars in his essay, The Undiscovered Self. He writes, quote, Since self-knowledge is a matter of getting to know the individual facts, theories are of very little help. For the more a theory lays claim to universal validity, the less capable it is of doing justice to the individual facts. Any theory based on experience is necessarily statistical. It formulates an ideal average which abolishes all exceptions at either end of the scale and replaces them by an abstract mean. This mean is quite valid, though it need not necessarily occur in reality. Despite this, it figures in the theory as an unassailable fundamental fact. The exceptions at either extreme, though equally factual, do not appear in the final result at all, since they cancel each other out. If, for instance, I determine the weight of each stone in a bed of pebbles and get an average weight of 5 ounces, this tells me very little about the real nature of the pebbles. Anyone who thought, on the basis of these findings, that he could pick up a pebble of 5 ounces at the first try would be in for a serious disappointment. Indeed, it might well happen that however long he searched, he would not find a single pebble weighing exactly five ounces. The statistical method shows the facts in the light of the ideal average, but does not give us a picture of their empirical reality. Then he, he goes on to say, Absolute reality has predominantly the character of irregularity. End quote. That is, the nature of our reality is entirely chaotic. The scientific knowledge seeks to make it organized and structured. Not just scientific knowledge, knowledge in general, right? It wants to make it organized and structured. It wants to make it so we know everything about the universe, right? And we, we, we see this with uh, things like, I mean, just like creation stories in general, right? We have a, um, what? God created the universe, right? At first there was nothing but God and then let there be light, right? And then the, the, uh, the physicists, you know, they're, they're all about the Big Bang, right? Which, you know, I'm not a complete denier of the Big Bang. I, I think it's possible. I'm also not a complete denier of, like, there being God that created the universe, but... But at the end of the day, both of these theories, the Big Bang and a God creating the universe, they're both kind of like, the, the point is we can't go back in time 13 billion years to see how the universe was created, right? It's, it's impossible. Um, and no matter how many, like, I don't care how many variables you have, how many data points you have. Like, we can't determine how the universe was created by, like, with a bunch of math problems and staring our telescopes out at space, right? I mean, I mean, like, um, sure, you can project that these things all started at one place, you know, by, by looking at how the universe is expanding and then uh, uh, retracting back everything and basically, like, reversing time, in a sense, to simulate how it all began, right? And yeah, maybe all these things were at one point um, together in one point. But that doesn't mean that that's how it all began, right? And But the, the thing is that we really want to know these things, right? We really want to know 
how the universe was created. We really want to know how all these things came to be. And so we search desperately to find the answers, right? Um, and that's kind of just what, that's what knowledge does, right? And by the seeking to make everything organized structure, making everything known, by doing so, this conveys a distorted precept of reality that although perhaps is correct in some particular aspect, still misses the point of what reality is like. Knowledge encompasses specific points with isolated variables, while the world itself exists in infinite points with infinite variables, infinite causes to everything. Like, wait, okay, like going back to the Big Bang Theory example, right? Um, I mean, with the Big Bang Theory, we're essentially, we're, we're projecting that the universe is expanding, right? And so if we roll time backwards and we, like, move our graphs backwards or whatever, we, we can project um, where it came from, right? The direction that it was going, right? But that also relies on our own observations of where these particular things are going. And we don't exactly know if there's anything that could have affected the movement that kind of came out of nowhere in such a way that things are expanding outwards, right? Um, so that's like another kind of critique there, right? Because we can't, um, like we can know particular things and we can know uh, the general direction of where things are going, but we still won't really have like, uh, we still won't see, be able to see the full picture, right? We can only see one piece of the puzzle. Um, we see the piece of the puzzle that the universe is expanding around us, but we can't really see the full universe expanding, right? We, we can only see like parts of it. Um, and so I'm not like d denying that or like saying that um, the Big Bang Theory is like a bunch of bullshit, but w what I am saying is that there's problems with believing in it with 100% certainty, right? Because this uh, kind of requires you to be confident in that um, we ha we basically have all the data available, or we have all the data that we need in order to project pr predict it 100%, right? But of course, that's why it's called the theory. Um, theories aren't supposed to be believed, right? <laughs> um, they're, they're just supposed to be, because uh, it's not the Big Bang fact, it's a Big Bang theory, right? Um, it's it's something to consider, and it's the best framework that we have so far. And on, on that one, I can I can agree with that one, right? Um, but but still, you know, we we're only seeing particular things, right? We're we're not seeing the the big picture. Um, and, and with that said, we kind of just see this kind of bias, like like single sided story, right? Um, so when you bring this to the, the human mind, um, in, in understanding the human mind in terms of self-knowledge, the means by which the individual may separate themselves from the conglomerate of human beings that exist within, um, that there is and can be no, quote, self-knowledge based on theoretical assumptions, for the object of this knowledge is an individual, a relative exception and an irregular phenomenon, end quote. And that's from the undiscovered self as well. All men are created different, infinitely different, and it is thus that they are not guaranteed such things as life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is up to them to guarantee these things for themselves, right? Yet, as we live in a society where every man is acknowledged as being equal to their fellow human being, He has no ability to differentiate himself from them and grasp some form of understanding of himself. Um, and, and sorry, I guess I'm kind of using, <laughs> um, I, I guess I'm kind of using language where like I'm saying like, I guess I'm kind of excluding all the other genders when I say that like every man is acknowledged, but 
if I say stuff like like every man is just just add in the disclaimer. If I say something like every man does this, I'm I'm really referring to like every human being. I guess I was kind of just thinking of myself, maybe. I don't know. But anyways, um, we live in a society where every human being is acknowledged as being equal to their fellow human being. They have no ability to differentiate themselves from them and grasp some form of understanding of themselves, right? Yet it is precisely in the understanding of oneself that they may be able to learn how to guarantee themselves such quote-unquote unalienable rights as life. Yet liberty and the pursuit of happiness um, Yet it is precisely in the understanding of oneself they may be able to learn how to guarantee themselves such quote-unquote unalienable rights as life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This self-understanding is further muddled by society's continued attempts at finding scientific and statistical knowledge of the human race, which, or uh, of the human mind, right? which, as mentioned, essentially leaves out the exception to the rule and defines all people as the same statistical average. But again, all people are the exception to the rule. And thus, scientific knowledge of psychology, while giving a general basis to how humans are, does not describe any one single human being, right? Or any single human being, right? just aspects of them very small minute pieces of them right that don't really give you much of a grasping on what humans are like right and humans aren't really like anything right but a human being is like something right? Be because everyone is different so young he, he lays out the difference between understanding and knowledge when he writes, quote, If I want to understand an individual human being, I must lay aside all scientific knowledge of the average man and discard all theories in order to adopt a completely new and unprejudiced attitude. I can only approach the task of understanding with a free and open mind, where his knowledge of man or insight into human character presupposes all sorts of knowledge about mankind in general. End quote. It is the difference between the shadows against the cave wall and the real person that walks behind you. Right? That is, knowledge is a mere symbolization and translation of understanding, but it is not understanding itself. As far as modern education goes, understanding is the exception and not the rule. People are taught how to know and not how to understand, how to think for themselves. People, people uh, they, they can recite hundreds of facts, but know nothing about what they mean. They give kids all these standardized tests of it, as if expecting all of them to know everything the same, and yet none of them understand the same, right? We all conceptualize things differently. Um, we, we all learn differently. We have different learning styles. Understanding is a deeply personal matter. It exists within our very own minds as a conceptualization, decompartmentalization, and integration of our experience of reality into the mental, logical framework of our own consciousness. But knowledge is different. Right? Knowledge is kind of all the same for everyone. It's kind of just words, right? And again, with, with language, science, and mathematics as a communication and standardization of our individual realities, they simply do not actually give one an understanding of reality, just hints about its nature. And regardless, language, science, and mathematics are all still magnificent tools that certainly help us understand reality. 
But that's not the point. The, the point is, our society emphasizes the importance of knowledge over the importance of understanding. That is, they want to tell people what to think rather than how to think. Turn everyone into equals while doing so, thus eliminating the autonomy of the individual. Nihilism, which in short is the belief that life is meaningless, defines the whole world as equal. The universe is meaningless and life is meaningless. It's all the same, just one big ball of nothingness, and nothing matters. Although this can be taken as a very positive and freeing thing to many people, it appears to stem from kind of that theistic frame of thought that all purpose in the universe is given to man by God. Thus, without God, there is no meaning to anything, right? So, so the nihilist, being an atheist, draws a conclusion that the world is meaningless without God. <laughs> And I just have to ask, why is it any more meaningful with God, right? And what, why, if meaning is something that is felt within you, something that you feel, like you feel meaning, you feel purpose, it's a feeling, then how does there being an outside force that created everything, how, how would that affect whether or not you have meaning in your life, right? If meaning is something that comes from within, so that, that that's like my my thing with the nihilists is that nihilists who are who are also atheists who don't believe in God, they also kind of take that conclusion. They take okay, if there is no God, then there is no meaning in the universe. That's kind of the the logical framework here. But that that just doesn't. It's I I, I personally think I think it lacks it lacks kind of a like, why does there need to be a God in order for there to be meaning, right? It just doesn't really make any sense. Um, so th this kind of draws to mind a section from Albert Camus' The Stranger. Or maybe it's, it's Albert Camus. I'm not sure. But when the, the protagonist is in court... He's taken to the magistrate's office in which the magistrate asked him if he believed in God. The passage reads, quote, He cut me off and urged me one last time, drawing himself up to his full height and asking me if I believed in God. I said no. He sat down indignantly. He said it was impossible. All men believed in God, even those who turned their backs on him. That was his belief. And if he were to ever doubt it, his life would become meaningless. That is, the, the nihilist, when realizing that God is dead, takes up a bit of mourning. He believes wholeheartedly that the world lacks any color, and he equates everything and everyone to mere conglomerates of atoms that float aimlessly through space. Yet somehow this assertion is better. It's, it's like somehow better. Because um, I've noticed that they kind of well, I mean, I used to think that I was a nihilist, or like I used to be a nihilist, right? I used to be someone who thought everything was meaningless, you know, like the world was kind of dark and disturbing. And I thought somehow like my belief that, <laughs> my like strong belief that there wasn't a God and that the world was meaningless made me better than everyone else, right? Um, and this is just such a, it's just so arrogant, Um to, to be in that framework because you're kind of saying that you're almost declaring that you know everything, right? That you like, you have it all figured out that, um, this is how the world is. And that's just like how it is. It's kind of like this closed minded framework. And it's, it's not really any better than believing that there is a God or that you're going to heaven or hell afterwards. Right. It's kind of, it's kind of the same thing. It's just another belief system. Right. Um, in both cases, the individual is reduced to be equal to all other individuals um, and follow all the same rules that every other individual. The theist and the nihilist forgets about individual differences, context, exceptions, etc. And in fact, when considering Christianity, the theists may even do a better job at remembering the individual, since Christ forgives the individual believer not the group of believers, right? I mean, either way, we see a reduction of the importance in the individual. 
accompanying this worldview of equalizing all souls is a certain desire to know everything about the world, perhaps more so the feeling that one knows everything about the world, right? Um, it, it is known that the higher the number of people who agree on something, the stronger the belief in this something. As such, if one wants to feel more confident in their beliefs, they will seek validation with others. If those other people do not believe in these beliefs, a sort of indoctrination attempt will likely occur. This is brought on by a certain fear of the unknown related to one not wanting to doubt their own reality. They find relief in getting others to agree with their understanding of reality. That is, indoctrination is motivated by wanting to doubt with, with wanting to doubt one's reality less to, solidi to solidify the validity of their understanding of reality. And like, I used to, um, and sometimes I still do, I, I don't even know why, like, I don't even not, like, I'm an agnostic. I, 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 I'm not an atheist, right? I, I neither believe or disbelieve in God. But, but I've, I've, sometimes I feel anger when people talk about, like, believing in God for some reason. I don't know why, because there's, it's impossible to prove if there is or is not a God. So me getting angry is almost a defense mechanism to kind of prevent myself from like doubting my own worldview. Right. And it's, it's sort of like this arrogant thing. Right. But, it, but, but it stems from fear. It stems from a fear of like not of feeling like you just don't know what's going on, right? Um, like you're just like floating through space aimlessly uh, w w without a clue what's going on. It, it makes you feel better when you have a, when you kind of feel like you know what's going on in the world, right? Um, now for, for the purposes of creating a safe and peaceful civilization, having everyone believe in the same thing can have amazing benefits. Um, and I, I, I'm pretty sure I talked about this at the beginning. But ha however, it teaches one to know rather than to understand, learn rather than to question, and find rather than discover. Democracy, and especially democratic, standardized education, are perhaps the most impressive large-scale forms of turning, quote-unquote, all men are created equal into a stark reality. This is especially apparent in our politics and education. However, it is perhaps most prevalent in our cultural activities of entertainment, most prevalently television, video games, and social media. Televisual culture, the formulation and statistical translation of our culture into moving stories on the TV, gives us our basis for knowledge on how people act, what people want, and how our culture as a as a country or perhaps even as a world, you know, as this televisual culture kind of expands out, right? Looks like, or more so what it should look like. Television, therefore, acts as not only a distraction, but as a sort of indirect manipulation of the masses, like a non-purposeful manipulation, right? Because like no one's, there's not like some, <laughs> there's not like some big group that's like deciding like, oh yeah, let's like, manipulate all these people into doing this. No. There's just kind of this uh, cultural, it's more like a uh, cultural pressures and basically like people, like people have an idea, they have a story and they write the story and you, you're not trying to persuade people of everything, uh, of anything, but when you write the story and you put it out there, um, people will feel something, right? They'll be moved. They'll be kind of manipulated in some way. And that's not, that's not on purpose, right? I mean, sure, sometimes it is on purpose, but most of the time for most television, most entertainment, you know, people aren't actively trying to manipulate people. But it does it anyways, because that's kind of the nature of when you take something in that has a theme, um, you're going to be swayed to think in a certain way, right? And it's not it's not on purpose. Um So while many works of art, um, songs, TV shows, etc., are created by one person or a small group of individuals, this art influences society on an extremely large scale. With the advent of the smartphone, 
these televisual and sociovisual culture, um, it, it has been enhanced by being both interactive and customizable. Now everyone can be a character in their own story and tell everyone else how they should be, think, feel, or act, right? The, the individual? Never heard of it. So now we, we recently finished up with a series on self-reliance. Yet, we neglected to go in depth on what exactly is keeping us from being self-reliant, how to metaphorically eliminate these things. It is apparent that mass media, social media, televisual entertainment, our education system, and many other properties of modern civilization are equalizing us all into mindless consumers of products. Um, and that's, that's with a grain of salt there, right? Um, but it, that's kind of like, uh, as far as like, you can kind of see the theme, right? Um, like you watch TV, there's commercials, um, and, and it's all kind of displaying a message, right? Um, and like, if we're taking this to like the extreme, then yeah, it's kind of turning us all into like these mindless consumers of products, right? I mean, the Netflix, that's a product. Um, a product that I very much enjoy, right? <laughs> and perhaps I mindlessly enjoy it, right? But but it's a um, it's it's a product nonetheless that I enjoy, that millions of people enjoy. Um, and, and I'm not saying that it's definitely not bad to watch TV, but uh, but it's not like something that's perhaps good to do all the time, right? Um, it, if you're mindlessly watching TV, like. 10 hours every single day, um, maybe that's not a good idea, right? Uh, but, but anyways, uh, th these things are turning our attention away from the sound of our own heart and what we want and desire to the sound of the herd's heart, what it tells us we should want and desire, right? It, in order to escape the chains of this cultural prison, we must first examine the chains itself. Upon this, we will find the key to unlock them not in the herd, but rather in ourselves. In many of the next few episodes, we'll be taking a deep dive into culture and self-knowledge, starting with a summary and analysis of David Foster Wallace's E. Unibus Plurum, Television and U.S. Fiction. And my name is Snowen, who will also be examining this subject, will be coming out with his very own podcast soon. Uh, he'll have his own explanation of E. Unibus Plurum with what will probably be a fucking incredibly in-depth audio essay, that will blow your mind to the Andromeda Galaxy. Um, but anyways, we will also be doing a couple of joint episodes during the topic, either on his, his mind, or both of our podcasts. Um, with, with that said, um, I do kind of want to say maybe, you know, I don't want to be misunderstood. And of course, with, uh, with language kind of being, as I said, it's kind of something that, um, it can kind of be a hard tool to use, right? Um, people aren't always going to understand you when you're talking about stuff. Um, and, like, we're all a part of this thing, right? We're all a part of this cultural, like, mega mass media, like, framework, right? We're all putting in our ideas and our thoughts into this, like, zeitgeist of knowledge and uh, culture, right? We're, we're all putting stuff into it. Um, and at, at the end of the day, these things are always going to be there. We're always going to have culture. We're always going to have entertainment. And because, I mean, we, we want these things, right? Like who, who in their right mind would just say, yeah, let's get rid of all TV in the world, right? Let's just, let's throw out Netflix, right? No, like there's not that many people that are going to say that. And I'm definitely not going to say that because I love Netflix. I love TV. I love video games. They're, they're awesome, right? They're fun to do. Um, but what I am saying is that we should recognize the effect that these things can have on us, right? Um, and we should recognize how we can become kind of addicted to these things or we can get kind of thrown into them and maybe we can kind of lose ourselves within them and kind of stop thinking for ourselves, right? And... In, in these cases, um, to, to prevent this from happening, we should look into ourselves. And for, for this next episode on the, the SAE Unibus Plurum, we'll be diving deep into kind of the damage 
that TV can do in you, or at least kind of examining what TV is and kind of how it works and how it intertwines with culture. Um, so that way we can kind of, we'll be able to kind of see why taking a step back and looking into ourselves, um, and, and even like looking into ourselves while we watch TV might be more fun, right? Because we can kind of like see, like instead of just watching the TV, like just for the purpose of entertainment, we can look at the TV and we can kind of get something out of the stories that we're watching, right? We can kind of use it to examine other things in our lives or maybe examine ourselves um, through certain lens. I mean, I think understanding ourselves, going into self-knowledge, I mean, that in and of itself can almost make TV more enjoyable. <laughs> it can make these things more enjoyable because uh, when you're kind of focused on understanding yourself, um, you, you kind of start to look at the world through the lens of like how how can all how, how does all this relate to me right um, and I think that's a very useful forward thinking positive mindset to have about the world um, and in that everything out there it all can be used to help us better understand ourselves and I think that's something awesome so Anyways, I appreciate you all listening to this episode on making all things equal. And I hope you have a wonderful next couple of weeks. So take it easy. Peace out.